Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the presence of our risen and triumphant Lord Jesus Christ and for the way in which he continues to speak through his written and living word. And we pray now that you would open our ears that we may hear him, that you would touch our hearts that we may respond to him, that you would bow our wills before his perfect and sovereign will, that we may serve and obey him, and that you will fill us in communion with your Holy Spirit with such joy in the study of your word that it will increasingly be our delight to be with you in it and to be taught by you from it. So hear us and help us, we pray, for Jesus, our Savior's sake. Amen. Please be seated. Now we're turning this evening as we continue our studies here in the great book of Revelation to Revelation chapters 12 and 13, essentially, which, as I said this morning, seem to me in a number of ways to stand not only physically at the center of the book of Revelation, but in many ways hold out to us the heart of the message of the book of Revelation. And this is by no means an unusual feature of the New Testament. For example, Paul's great letter to the Romans probably has its most significant passage in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. And when you grasp what the Apostle Paul is saying there, so much more of what he says in his letter to the Romans begins to make sense. But we're not talking this evening about Romans, we're talking about the book of Revelation. Those old-time movies that David Lawton and his grandfather used to go and watch that some of us are old enough to remember employed a technique that you see in a very different way in contemporary movies. All of us know about this technique. Some of us were actually at the old John Wayne movies. And what happened in those John Wayne movies was that the action was going on, the gunfight was going on perhaps in the OK corral somewhere outside of town and when most of the people had been shot to smithereens, then suddenly there would be a voice or even just a, a screen would appear that would say, you remember, and now back at the ranch. And so you would be moved back unceremoniously back to the ranch where Mrs. Wayne and the children were getting the afternoon meal ready for the great hero as he came home or something. And this was usually the reason for the technique. That in order to understand the rest of the story, in a way you needed to move backwards. You needed to draw in to learn something else and then you could be launched forwards into the future. And in many ways, that's the role of these particular chapters 12 and 13 and the chapters that follow in the book of Revelation. We've seen the throne of God in chapters 4 and 5 and the great seals being opened. And then momentarily we've seen the throne of God and from that throne the, the great the great trumpets have gone out to trumpet the judgments of God. And now interestingly, again, at the end of chapter 11, we are back there at the throne of God. God's temple in heaven is opened and the Ark of the Covenant is seen within his temple and this great sense of the majesty of God, flashings of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy Hail. But before we proceed further, as we eventually shall do, to the outpouring of the seven bowls of God's final wrath and judgment, it's as though John is beginning to see things that both help him to understand the significance of what he has already seen at an even deeper level and will prepare him for the majesty and glory 
that is still yet to come. In other words, just as we have already seen, the seals are opened, and then as the trumpets are sounded, there is this sense of intensification as God moves towards the climax of his glorious judgments and saving purposes for his people. Now John sees a number of scenes. Some scholars over the years have believed that there are actually seven of them. So that you've got seven seals being opened, seven trumpets sounded, seven signs appearing and seven bowls of wrath being poured out. Whether there are seven or not, it's true that John is not particularly concerned to tell us that they are seven. But he is concerned to share with us the secrets of these great signs, these visions he sees in heaven of the woman and the dragon and the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth and later on the lamb and the 144,000 and the three angels of God and then the glorious harvest that is to come. But as we look at chapters 12 and 13, we immediately, as we, as we simply skate over the surface of these chapters, there are certain things, markers we might call them, that give us an indication of how we are to understand these verses. Because you notice that the same time frame reappears in these chapters as we've already seen. It's variously described. Chapter 12, verse 6, as 1,260 days. Chapter 12, verse 14, as one time, two times, and half a time. Three and a half years, which are the equivalent of 1,260 days. And then in chapter 13, verse 5, 42 months, which are again the equivalent of 1,260 days and a time, times, and half a time. And we noticed already, you remember, that these figures are not really difficult to understand. They are figures that describe the period, the time period, in which the church of Jesus Christ has its present existence. The time period when the seals of God's purposes are being opened. The time period when God here and there is exercising his judgments upon the world. But it's evident now that John is seeing that time period variously described in an altogether more profound way than he has heretofore done. But what I want us to try and do this evening in the time that we've got in chapters 12 and 13 is essentially to look at three things. First of all, to look at the big picture here. That's a very obvious thing for us to do, to ask the question, what is the big picture here? If you can just get the big picture then you'll be able to plot your way through the book of Revelation. Second, what might be the meaning of some of the details in this big picture? And third, and practically, what then is the message of this picture? The big picture, some of its details, and its practical message. Well, first of all, what's the meaning of the big picture. Well, the question in the book of Revelation is this. What do you see here? And as you look at these chapters, interestingly again, you see details that are reminiscent of some of the things, for example, from the book of Daniel. These strange, monstrous heads that seem to appear on these beasts are so reminiscent of the great beasts that Daniel describes as he sees the visions of God's amazing purposes, particularly in Daniel chapter 7. And 
And perhaps also you're reminded of the closing chapters of the book of Job in which God calls Job to account and then shows him two extraordinary monsters. One that seems to arise from the land, Behemoth, and another that seems to rise from the sea, Leviathan. Which sometimes, again, scholars have seen as symbols, pictures of the powers of darkness. And all of this is here also in Revelation chapters 12 and 13. But here's probably the best clue. Answer this question mentally in your mind. How many beasts do you see? Let me ask the question again. You'll not find the answer by looking at me. It's in the text. How many beasts do you see? And the answer, of course, is three. And that in all likelihood is the single most important clue as to how we are to understand what is going on here. There is, first of all, the red dragon who has these seven diadems, picture of majesty, picture almost of an infinite majesty. And then there is the sea beast, one of whose most obvious characteristics is that he has received a mortal wound. But from that mortal wound, he has been extraordinarily, miraculously healed. And then there is this earth beast that does great signs, that calls down fire from heaven, whose ministry, if I can put it this way, whose ministry is to bear witness to the sea beast who has the wound of a mortal kind from which he has been healed. And if you need a further clue, it lies in what we will find in successive weeks that out of, out of these three monsters that arise, there appears to be a great city that is built, actually called a prostitute city, the great city of Babylon. And when you have seen these things, you have all the clues you need to understand that this is a picture of the unholy trinity of the powers of darkness. And that's its significance. It's a picture of the way in which the powers of darkness array themselves against our great and glorious triune God and the church that he is building. And in this mirror image way, the red dragon appears as an infinitely majestic figure. And then he, he has, dare we call it, a bestial son who has a mortal wound from which he has healed. And the bestial son has a servant like himself who carries all of his authority, who points to him dare I say it to use Bible language, who glorifies him before men. And you see, when you've seen that, especially when you understand this is a revelation that was given to John, you begin immediately to see how what is portrayed to us here is not, it's not so much individual human beings that at some point or another we are supposed to be able to identify in history. But the dark, unholy trinity that builds its ungodly prostitute Babylon in the face of the holy and blessed trinity, the father of an infinite majesty, the son who has died and been raised again, the Holy Spirit whose chief office is to glorify and magnify the Lord Jesus and bring the nations to his feet in saving grace and faith and tribute to him in service, through whom the church of Jesus Christ will be built so that one day, as a bride prepared for 
her bridegroom. She will appear as the new Jerusalem. But you see, when we see that, we've already been given an extraordinarily powerful picture, haven't we? Of the darkness, the sinister nature, the ungodliness, and the goal of the unholy trinity. The goal of the unholy trinity is to seek to destroy all the work of the blessed holy trinity and to build a Babylon that will stand as a permanent monument to ungodliness and to rebellion against his gracious and glorious purposes. And so that is the big picture. It's the picture of the unholy in the face of the gracious and the holy. It's a picture of the ungodly and the dark in the face of the godly and the light. But having said that, we need to ask ourselves a second question. If that is the meaning of the big picture, what does the trinity of the dark side do? Or to put it in a different way, what is the precise activity of these individual beasts? Now we notice that there are three of them. The first and obviously the easiest to identify is the red dragon because we're given very specific clues. And we always in studying passages like this we want our eyes to be drawn to the clues that first of all help us. And we're given a very obvious clue in verse 9 of chapter 12, aren't we? The great dragon was thrown down. He is that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. And his activity, well, we're given a clue to that in verse 5. The woman that we've seen gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Words, you remember, come from the second psalm, which is a psalm quoted, I think, or alluded to maybe almost 20 times in the New Testament. And it points to the messianic reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here is this red dragon who is the ancient serpent. And he is, as it were, before the woman who is about to give birth, who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. But the child is delivered and escapes and is caught up to the throne of God. Well then, who is the woman? Well, notice the description of the woman. The woman is clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Let me put it very simply. This woman is essentially the people of God in all ages. This woman is the embodiment of God's covenant promise that through the seed of Abraham, he would bring saving blessing to all the nations. She has these twelve stars in her crown, reminiscent, of course, of the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve apostles of the New Testament church. She has, notice, the moon under her feet. Now the moon is in this context viewed as the, as the reflector of the sun. Just as the light of grace that we find in the Old Testament covenant community is the reflection of the grace that we find in the new covenant community in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now the sun is arisen. The sun is beginning to shine. And this woman is going to be persecuted. In fact, she's already been persecuted because she's, she's in the pangs of labor. The run up to the birth of Christ has been a run up full. The labor has been full of discomfort and agony. 
And now as the Lord Jesus Christ is born, and this has almost a literal fulfillment in the New Testament scriptures, doesn't it? That in the person of Herod, the dragon was there almost at the opening of the womb of the woman in order to destroy the Christ child that God would send into the world to be its saviour. And it's the story of the Lord Jesus in essence and the marvellous way in which the dragon, Satan, has sought to destroy the Lord Jesus through Herod, through the temptations, through his death on the cross, through the betrayal of Judas, through Pontius Pilate, through the high priests, through the people shouting crucify, destroy him. But all the while the child grown into the man Christ Jesus has been kept gloriously safe under the providential sovereign hand of God. You see what the message is? We're really back to our old friends. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. The seed of the woman will be in antagonism to the seed of the serpent and the day will come when the serpent will bruise or crush the heel of the seed of the woman. But the seed of the woman, as the next little section underlines for us, will crush the head of the serpent. And what will the serpent become? A fat dragon by seeking to devour people over the centuries. What will the dragon do? When he knows he can no more have access to molest the Christ. Well, we're told he will pursue Christ's people. He will pursue the woman. He will pursue all those to whom the woman gives birth. And it's a staggering picture of an enraged enemy who is seeking to destroy the people of God. And what John is now seeing is, this is, as it were, the bottom line story of the life of the Christian church. As our Lord Jesus has said, as we've already noted, I don't know how many times in this study, I will build my church on enemy-occupied soil, but the gates of Hades will not be able to overrule or destroy. And you get this marvelous picture that's so reminiscent of the way God protected the pilgrim people in the wilderness. And how when it looked as though they were going to be destroyed in the waters, God parted the waters. And then as Pharaoh thought he would pursue them, Pharaoh himself and his soldiers are overcome by the waters. It's a glorious picture. Of the way in which the dark satanic fatherhood opposes the father of an infinite majesty as he sends his son to be the savior of sinners. But God shields his people. Now to that we shall return. What about the other beasts? The sea beast in Revelation 13, 1 through 10. There are many commentators really who believe that this really is an allusion to Caesar Nero. And to all that he sought to do to destroy the people of God using them as a scapegoat for his own ghastly incompetence. And perhaps there is some kind of echo of Nero and his persecution here. But it seems to me that John has something far more awesome than Nero in his sights here. In this description of the beast that comes from the sea, that speaks blasphemy against God, that seeks to oppress the people of God that receives worship that is anathema to God's people. Look at chapter 13, verse 4, for example. 
they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Now, those of you who know your Old Testament somewhat well, does that remind you of one of the great Old Testament texts? This false worship, who is like the beast? Who can stand against the beast? Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? You see. And you see this in the world, don't you? Who can stand against the beast? It's a world set apart from Worshipping, knowing, trusting, loving God. It's the world. It's the world out there, my friends, that says everybody's doing it and nobody can swim against the tide and nobody believes that kind of thing any longer. Who can stand against the beast? Do you see the mirror image of Christ here? Many names exalted Worship, seeking a world-wide dominion. That's why it's all the clearer who the earth beast is. Because the earth beast bears witness to the beast from the sea. Do you notice how marvelously John describes him? He's described as, look at verse 11 of chapter 13. It's amazing, really. He had two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. Now, here is one of the most important principles in all the world for Christian believers to get hold of. Do not trust your eyes. Trust only what you hear from God through your ears in his word. If you, in your leisure, survey the descriptions of temptation and sin, you'll find in the Old and the New Testament scriptures, you'll find in almost every single one of them, the ghastly error that individuals made was to trust what they saw with their eyes, forgetting what God said about those things through his word. And one of the greatest needs of our time in our dreadfully undiscerning evangelical community today is the people of God who will see through their ears and not through their eyes. Because that's our only security. But you see, it is the devilish tactic to say, look at me. Remember that little section in Jungle Book with the eyes? Trust in me, trust in me, trust in me. And our eyes are caught up. Just like Eve's was in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember what's said about her? She stood before the tree about which God in his holy voice had said, Do not eat the fruit of that tree. Please. And she saw the serpent dangling from it. And we're told that she saw that the tree was delightful to the eyes. And the fruit looked juicy to the taste and she'd forgotten all about what God said in his word to which she should have listened through her ears and she was gone or David 2 Samuel 11 as he looks over the parapet of his house and he sees this unusually beautiful woman and he begins to think with his eyes instead of with his ears. Begins to pursue his vision rather than his listening to the voice of God. So this disguise has got Satan written all over it from the very beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. He is, as it were, this beast like an ungodly Spirit who seeks to draw us to the glory of this world 
as it stands opposed to God and his infinite grace and his divine majesty and to say, don't you think that what you can see is more important than what you hear? Now we've been duped by this, haven't we? A picture is worth a thousand words. But you know, a picture doesn't mean anything unless it's got words. You've no idea what a picture means unless there are words that help you to understand it. It can make an impact on you, yes. But you need an explanation. And here in this dark picture of the way in which the serpent grown into a dragon works, all of the emphasis is on being deceived. And my dear friends, you and I are deceived by him almost every single day of our lives, aren't we? So deceived, we hardly notice it. And the church of Jesus Christ, so deceived, we hardly notice it. Why? Because we trust in the things that we can see. And we so little engage in the things that are invisible and are eternal. And so this is a word that helps us so much, so very, very, very much to understand what it means to be, as David Lawton was saying to the children, in the spiritual battle. Now here's the million dollar question. I suppose nowadays it's a hundred million dollar question. Who is this beast? And the answer is given to us, isn't it? In the very last statement of chapter 13. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who is understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it's the number of a man. Or perhaps, as I think that probably should be translated, it is the number of man. And his number is 666. Six, six. Now, if you had $100 for every identification of 666 six, six in the history of the church, even if you don't have a job yet because you're still at college or university, you could retire right now. Everybody from Nero to... Well, I suppose even Bill Clinton, there's a way of making Bill Clinton add up to 666. There was, I remember, a way of making Henry Kissinger add up to 666. I remember that very clearly. I never managed to get the arithmetic, but I remember that very clearly. Now that's $300 in my pocket already. Nero, Bill Clinton, Henry Kissinger, Napoleon, Martin Luther, he was a favorite. Oliver Cromwell, he was another favorite. The Pope, he was a favorite. But you see, the numbers in the book of Revelation are, are symbols, aren't they? That's been one of our principles of understanding what's happening in the book of Revelation. These numbers are symbols. They stand for spiritual powers. They stand for the whole community of God's people. Or they stand for the whole community of the people who are set against God. And it seems to me, despite all the ink that has been spilt over identifying 666, that the simplest answer to the identification is the best. This is the number of man without God. And you would see then why it would be 666. Because the perfect number is 7. It's a trinity of sixes that fall short of the trinity of 7. It's, as it were, man in his ungodliness. And so interestingly, we might say that what we've got here in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation is the picture book version of Matthew 16, 18. 
the gates of hell will seek to destroy my church, but I will build it. And what we've got here in chapter 13 is the picture book version of Romans 1, 21 to 23. Man in his ungodliness, refusing to worship God, believing the lie, substituting the lie about God rather than the truth, going his own way, being given over to ever-increasing ungodliness and actually encouraging, as Paul says to us at the end of Romans 1, encouraging people to stand and live against God. By nature, we have six, six, six written all over the universe. Well, if that's the big picture and these are some of the details and there are many more details, it would be lovely to have another four hours for us just to think about the details because they're all so magnificently interesting. But let me now, just in a minute, come to the application. What is the message of this vision? If that's the big picture and these are the small details about the beasts, what is the message of the vision? And it's summarized in one statement in chapter 12, verse 11. They overcame him. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Now the question. How do I know that I can overcome as those of you who have been with the book of Revelation since we started it in, in the letters to the churches in the first three chapters, again and again, you remember the promise was given to those who overcome, to those who overcome, to those who overcome. So here's my question. How do I know that I'm going to be able to overcome these dark forces that seek to destroy my Christian faith? And John gives us Four clues, really. Clue number one. You need to learn to unmask his true identity because he is by nature the deceiver of the brothers. Do you notice that language? I think it's, it's both illuminating and frightening. We are told that he is the great deceiver. And so he's not going to appear, you see, like a dragon. He's going to appear like a lamb. He's going to entice us. And we need to recognize his presence. We need especially to listen with biblically cleansed eardrums to what he says in order that we can see through what he shows us. You've got that principle? That's why the key to living this overcoming life is not having some special mystical experience that makes you an overcomer. The key to having this overcoming life is to be able to say with David, I have hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You need to learn, my friends, to see through lenses that have been ground for you in the Scriptures. And if you're able to do that, you'll be able to unmask him and overcome him as you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Second thing you need to know, you need to know what is his characteristic activity. His characteristic activity, verses 9 and 10 of chapter 12 again, his characteristic activity is to accuse the brothers. Now I wish I had another night to explore this. Perhaps if God gives me breath, I'll come back to it. But this is something especially as you begin the Christian life. You need to know that the devil's central activity to bring you down is to accuse you of sin and guilt and to make much of it and to try to hide you from the cross of Jesus Christ or hide the cross from you. 
That's why, incidentally, very few of us have ever been to an evangelical seminar that has focused on the cross. Why? Because Satan wants to hide it. That's why, actually, when you take evangelical preaching and teaching and literature today, there's appallingly little on the cross. Why is that? Because Satan wants to hide it. You remember that passage in Pilgrim's Progress where the the dear pilgrim is making his way along and suddenly he finds that there are, there are blasphemous thoughts in his mind. And some of you never had, had this kind of experience. I would guarantee there are some people sitting in this room tonight who, even as mature Christians, have had blasphemous thoughts about Christ invading their mind. And we're told pilgrim was sore pressed by this. Where was this coming from? And he didn't see that there was a shadowy figure injecting those thoughts into his mind. And then, as it were, standing in his way and saying, how can you possibly be a Christian believer with that kind of thing in your mind and heart? And he was almost gone, and you are almost gone, my friends. Unless you discern his presence and you say to him, but these are not thoughts I want. And you can accuse me all you want, but I know that the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down from heaven. Because the one who stands in heaven for me is the one who has died for the guilt of those accusations you bring against me. And you're able to stand against him so long as whenever you are sorely pressed, as we sometimes sing, be thou my shield and hiding place that sheltered near thy side, I may my fierce accuser face and tell him Christ has died. And then you need to persist in your testimony. You need courage. You need courage. Holy Spirit given courage to overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. He has died for your sins and the word of your testimony as one who does not love his or her life to death. Now I want an easier way to overcome the dragon than that to be perfectly honest. I want a way to overcome the dragon that means if I can give only 95% of my life to Jesus Christ, I can be sure I'm going to overcome the dragon. My dear friends, he's grown fat from being a serpent to becoming a dragon because of people like me who have been 95% committed. No, the only way to overcome the dragon is when Christ is all of you and you have all of Christ. And so I need to deal with whatever it is in my heart that keeps arguing with them and says 95 percent, 96%, 97%, 98%, 99%, 99.9%, anything, Lord, but all of me. And you see this passage is telling you you're only safe when he is all of you. But oh, the glory when he has all of you. Because then you know that you have all of him. And then the great thing. We don't rest in our consecration. We don't rest in our wisdom. We don't rest in our discernment. We rest gloriously in the victory of Jesus Christ. He has overcome. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, what fears are stilled when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. I'll stand. Now, dear ones, this is either true or it's nonsense. It's either glorious gospel or it is absolute gobbledygook.
And if you believe, it is most glorious truth. Then live this way. Because the one thing that is sure is none who has ever lived this way has ever died regretting it. Oh, may it be true of us in this world in which we live. Our Heavenly Father, there's too much for us in this passage, too much for us in your Bible. We can't take it all and sometimes we confess we can't bear it all because you're always giving us more and we're always wanting only a little. You're always showering your grace upon us and we're always wanting to depend upon ourselves. And you've given your son to us and we're not sure whether he's worthy of our reception. Oh, God, deliver us from that blindness that makes us follow the beasts to worship the world and open the eyes of our understanding through Jesus Christ that we may, in truth, worship the Father through the Son.